Welcome back to Echo Ridge and the last episode of our Absolute Beginner's Guide for Civilization VI. We're going to continue right where we left off. In Washington, we've completed our settler, and when we select it, the map automatically goes in settler lens mode, which is basically highlighting where it is possible to settle and showing where the sources of fresh water are. Because remember that fresh water is a plus three, coastal water is plus one, and with no water, it's a no housing bonus. But notice the rings around Washington and Cardiff means we could not settle a city in there because it's too close to another city. In this case, I think the best place for me to settle might be all the way over here. And there's a reason why. There is no more land over here. Which means I don't have any enemy AIs coming over threatening to settle next to me. But it looks like this area here is connected to a greater landmass. So I want to settle this area quickly before an AI comes and gets us. Additionally, the longer Cardiff is here, the more tiles they're going to gobble up. So by settling the city now, we'll have access to keep gaining these tiles around it. Now, six tiles away is about the maximum distance that I would settle a city in most circumstances. Ideally, I like four and five tiles away because there are some improvements later on that'll give bonuses to all cities within six tile range, seven tile range, etc. This scout did spot Washington, and now we have a mess of barbarians coming towards the city. Not too big of a deal. We're going to scooch by with our settler. You have to be careful because the barbarians will steal your settler. But we're going to send our warrior up. We also have a couple of scouts here and some nice defensive terrain, such as this hilly forest right here. So I think we're going to be okay. Also, we've reached the location where our settler was heading so we can found our second city. And now we have the city of Chicago. Of note, it does not have a palace, because remember, only your capital city has a palace, so it starts off with just about nothing. We also have one population here, so the city is working two food from this tile, two food from this tile for a total of four food, and then one production here and one production here. But notice, we're not getting a full two production, and it's because we have minus one amenities. And with minus one amenities, our citizens are displeased which is providing minus 10% to non-food yields. This is not going to be an issue too much longer because when we finish this builder, we're going to be able to improve this cotton tile and gain access to cotton. And the way amenities work is this one cotton source will be able to provide up to four amenities. In this case, it's going to provide two amenities, one for Washington and one for Chicago. If we were to put down two more cities, it would provide one amenity for all four. In Washington, it's not a problem because we have two amenities. The reason why we have two amenities is because, remember, the palace gives us plus two amenities from entertainment. We also get our own production queue inside of Chicago. I think in this case, the barbarians are getting a little spicy, so we're probably going to start working on a slinger. And as promised, the builder is out, and we're going to be able to get down our first plantation. Notice Chicago has the amenity it needs based on its population. So we're no longer taking a debuff to our yields. I also wanted to point out that when we discovered bronze working, it revealed an iron strategic resource. So far, we'd seen bonus resources and luxury resources, but we had not seen strategic resources. Some units require strategic resources to build. For instance, the swordsman, the upgrade to the warrior, will require 90 production, 20 iron, and 2 gold. The next closest iron I see was right next to where we're going to settle our third city, which will be very important when we do get iron working. So we're going to get working on a settler now. We're still dealing with some barbarian issues down here, and it's always good to keep increasing your military strength. And we've also earned 247 gold. So I think we're also going to buy a warrior from the city of Washington. We have finished up state workforce, so I think we're going to come back here and get foreign trade. It'd be nice to get a trader online which foreign trade unlocks, even though we haven't met anybody else, which is rather odd, we can at least start trading with Cardiff or send some domestic trade routes, for instance, from Washington to Chicago. More on that in a little bit. But it also means we've unlocked the government plaza, which might be our first district inside of Washington. Additionally, we've unlocked a governor title. When this happens, we can appoint a new governor or promote an existing one. In our current setup, I like getting Pingala. Pingala starts with 15% increase in science and culture generated by the city. So we'll click a point, click on Washington, take note that the loyalty in Washington goes from 21 to 29, 
and then we'll click assign. I'm getting ready to clear out this slinger. It's been pretty beaten up, but I wanted to highlight something specific here. This warrior is going to be attacking across this river. And because of it, this slinger is going to be getting a plus five to combat strength because they have a river defense. In other words, because my warrior has to literally cross the river to attack into the slingers. But because I have two warriors here and a scout, we're getting plus four to flanking bonus. And also the slingers sitting in a floodplain, so they're receiving a minus two to unfavorable terrain. Plus, they're really damaged, so this is a no contest win. Oh, happy day. The next turn, we've reached 25 faith. Remember some time ago, we had put in God King, which gave us the plus one faith per turn. Well, now we get to unlock our own Pantheon. The Pantheon is sort of a belief system for, in this case, the Americans living in 2520 BC. There are a lot of options, just like everything else in the game, for what you want to choose as your Pantheon belief. I recommend you taking time to review all of them when you hit this in your game. In this game, I think we're going to go with Goddess of Festivals, plus one culture from plantations. So I'll select it, and then found this Pantheon. Our next step would be earning a religion. Now, full religion gameplay is outside the scope of this beginner's guide, but remember when we talked about great people? Well, in order to start earning great profit points, in which the first great profit would require 60, which all the enemy AI are trying to achieve at the same time, we would need to put down a holy site district. It and its buildings would give us one great profit points per turn. So if we had, for instance, a holy site with a shrine in it, we would be getting a total of two great profit points. If after 30 turns, we were the first ones to 60 great profit points, we would earn the great profit. And that would look something like this. I've gone back in the save and have researched astrology first, which unlocks the holy site. Here in Washington's production queue, we see we have access to the holy site. Notice it says that the district itself would give us the plus one great profit points per turn. So I'm gonna go ahead and place that down. And with a lot of districts, you will see some natural adjacency bonuses. For instance, if I place the holy site here, I don't get any bonuses. But if I place it in one of these tiles, you'll see we'll get a plus one faith from the adjacent mountain tile. In the Civilopedia, we can see all the adjacency bonuses available to each district. In the Holy Sites case, we'll get plus two faith from each adjacent natural wonder tile, plus one from just about every mountain type, plus one from every two adjacent wood tiles, plus one faith from every two adjacent districts, and plus one faith from each government plaza, which is the district we talked about earlier. So in this specific case, we'd have to pay 55 gold to unlock these tiles early, but we wouldn't have to here. So we'll select this tile, build the holy site, and in seven turns, it'll be complete. With our holy site complete in the city of Washington, now when we go to our production queue, under the holy site, we have the ability to build a shrine, which is gonna give us plus two faith, a citizen slot, and a great profit point per turn. What the citizen slot means is if we go down to manage citizens, Citizens cannot work the holy site. Well, when we finish the shrine, we will be able to work the holy site, gaining us additional faith. With the shrine complete, we can go into our great people menu and see that we're making two great profit points per turn. The other AIs are not making any great profit points. But let's say we really wanted to push towards that great profit as soon as possible. Or if you had a campus and were earning great scientist points, Maybe you wanted to really push hard for a great scientist. We also can use civic cards to boost our great person production as well. For instance, in mysticism, the revelation card gives us plus two great profit points per turn. Unfortunately, we don't have any wild card slots yet, but we will once we research political philosophy and change our government. We're putting down a government plaza, which you may remember we said that a holy site next to a completed government plaza, we'll get another adjacency bonus, so it'll be earning two faith per turn. With the government plaza complete, you can see now that our holy site by itself is getting three faith. One adjacency bonus from being next to a mountain, one for being next to the government plaza, and one for being next to two districts, the city center district and the government plaza, earning us a total of three faith. We are earning five faith per turn, because our shrine is also giving us two faith. Additionally, if we wanted to further rush towards 
our great person, we could possibly put down the Oracle Wonder, which if we were to complete it, would mean the patronage of great people would cost 25% less faith. That's when you faith purchase a great person directly. And districts in the city will provide plus two great person points of their type. Since we are earning great profit points, we'd get two more great profit points per turn. Additionally, Pingala also has a promotion that'll give us plus 100% great people points generated per turn in the city. Also, by switching our government to the Classical Republic, we're going to be earning plus 15 great person points. Now we have two wildcard policy slots as well. Now we're going to put in Revelation to get a plus two great profit points, but we could also put in plus two great scientist points per turn, even though we don't have a campus. And that's where these compounding strategies really start to pay off. And with all those being stacked, we were earning 6.9 great profit points per turn. So at the beginning of the turn, it's telling us we have a great person to claim. And in this case, it is our great profit. Once you have the great profit, you move them into the holy site and you found your religion. In the religion screen, you can choose a historical religion or you can choose to make your own custom religion, such as the way of chaos. From this point, you'll be able to choose religious beliefs, which once again allows you to continue to stack benefits and possibly help out your grand strategy for the game. In this case, we'll first choose choral music, which will allow shrines and temples to provide culture equal to their intrinsic faith output. And we've been making some pretty good culture with all of our plantations. And then we get a second belief when we found a religion. Now we could go even more culture, but to tell you the truth, I think we probably have enough. So maybe we want to amplify our science or perhaps our gold output. Once you've selected everything, we found the religion. We'll get some era score and Washington now falls the way of chaos. If we take a look at the religion lens, we can see that Cardiff will convert to the way of chaos in 63 turns. And that is the effect of the natural religious pressure coming off of Washington. Alternatively, we can now faith purchase missionaries, which would then be able to walk over there more directly spreading the way of chaos. While full religious gameplay is outside the scope of this tutorial, I at least wanted to give you a little bit of primer so you know what you're looking at. Let's go ahead and head back to Washington in the other timeline. We've completed foreign trade, so we're gonna take a look at our policies. I still like the plus five unit combat strength when fighting barbarians, but considering I'm not going for a religious game and we already have our Pantheon, I think we can take out God King. And since we have two cities, I think the plus one production in all cities is more helpful. Now we're gonna head into early empire, which gives us another governor title some more civic policies, allows us to establish open borders with other civilizations. It opens up a war type and gives us the ability to give the open borders with other civilizations. So we're gonna head into that and then into political philosophy so we can unlock classical era governments. Over in Chicago, it'd be nice to get another amenity. Because Washington and Chicago already have access to cotton, we can't just add another cotton. Instead, we need to find different amenities. But this salt tile is outside of Chicago's borders. Remember, we went for a slinger first in Chicago. If we would want for a monument, we'd be getting more culture out of here. More culture means more border growth. So I think next we are going to be going with monument. But for the time being, we can actually purchase this salt tile for 65. Once we do that, we can then build a salt mine. Chicago now gains access to salt. And if we work this tile, we'll get two food, two production, and one gold. In Washington, we have access to be able to place one of our first districts. We have the option of the encampment that we unlocked from bronze working, or the government plaza that we unlocked from state workforce. In this case, I'm going to get started on my government plaza because it's going to award us another governor title. Plus, it's going to provide eight loyalty per turn to the city, and it's going to give an increase of plus one to the adjacency bonuses being earned by any adjacent district. This is where planning out where your districts are going to go becomes very important. Another strategy you can use is trying to find a tile that you really don't care about or the least valuable tile. And in this case, it is definitely this floodplain here. The disadvantage, though, is it's on a floodplain tile, so that district could get damaged quite a bit. So I think we're going to put it here on this Grasslands Hill. We place the government plaza and it starts to be built. Now, if I were to take my production and change it and say, let's do the granary instead, we would be locked in to the 
production cost of that district. But the longer the game goes, the districts will cost more production. But as long as you place it down for that cheaper cost, that's what it'll cost forever. Now in this case, I don't really need the granary because we still have plenty of housing and food. So we will work on the government plaza. Also take note that we can't build another district here until we reach a population of four. And then after that, population of seven, where you get another district. Since we finished early empire this turn, we have access to another governor title. And in this case, I actually think we're gonna promote Pingala. Sometimes you'll want more governors and sometimes you'll want to keep promoting one governor. The reason why I'm doing it here is because, well, I want more science per turn and Pingala's researcher promotion gives plus one science per turn for each citizen in the city. Now, because there's so many barbarians around, I'm not gonna let this settler walk around unprotected. So I'm gonna create an escort formation with the warrior. Now, when one moves, the other moves. We only have two tiles to go, but this is a smart play nonetheless. We have finally met another civilization. It is Pedro II of Brazil, and we have some options here. We can say, well met stranger, but I'm afraid we are too busy to stay and chat, or it's an honor to meet you. Don't miss out on the diplomacy game. In fact, at some of the later difficulty, it is imperative that you do not ignore the diplomacy game in civilization. Pedro is offering us to come see Brazil, and enjoy some of their hospitality. We're definitely going to accept that. And now we see that Pedro II of the Brazilian Empire is appearing up here. We're going to go one step further and we're going to send them a delegation as well. It'll cost us 25 gold, but if they accept, which they did, and then we go click on this relationship screen, we can see that we sent them a delegation which gave them a plus three opinion of us. Also, their first impression of us was a plus one. I'm also going to make a deal with them and offer them my open borders. Chances are they'll give us a little bit of gold for this. Two gold per turn, as a matter of fact. We'll take that. Now, when we go to our relationship screen, we have a plus seven to our relationship. And the reason why we discovered them is because our scout finally made it up this gap and discovered Rio de Janeiro. I can zoom in around their city and see what's going on. You can highlight over Rio de Janeiro itself and see that they have a monument and a palace. We can also see that they're building a wonder in the very next turn, Pedro is asking if we want to receive a diplomatic delegation. We're going to tell him, hey, it's most welcome. All these sort of relationship things will lead to friendships and possibly one day to alliances that once again will unlock bonuses to help out your civilization and theirs. Down here next to the Great Salt Lake, we're ready to found our third city, and it is Charleston. And this iron tile is going to be very important in just about two turns. If we were just a little bit quicker, we could have built this iron mine and boosting iron working, but it looks like it's gonna happen probably one turn too late. We're gonna go ahead and buy that builder here because getting this iron online will be very, very important. We've researched iron working, unlocking the wonderful swordsman. So when we click on our warriors here, you can see that there's an upgrade button that for 110 gold and 20 iron, we can actually upgrade this warrior to a swordsman. We lack the gold and the iron, right now though. But by creating this mine, we'll start earning some beautiful iron, our first strategic resource. If we highlight over the tile, you can see that this specific iron tile is going to give us two iron per turn. Notice that iron working is a classical era technology. When we go look over our ancient era timer, it looks like there's only six turns until this era ends. Luckily, we've gotten 16 era points so far, so we are firmly into a normal age. But because we reached the classical era, we've unlocked classical roads, which will help the movement speed along that road. So if there's a road on a hill, it'll make the movement one instead of its normal two. We'll learn more about roads once we get traders. Our scout has revealed another city-state. We are not the first civilization to find them. Brussels is another industrial city-state. And we can click the influence buy and see that there's one unmet player that's given them an envoy. We've managed to drive back the barbarian invaders in Washington. We have some cleanup to do here. We'll use a builder and repair this farm because their barbarian pillaged it, which is an ability that combat units have when they're in enemy territory. So now we're going to head up here to this barbarian encampment and once and for all take care of it. Of note, anytime you don't have visibility in an area, there's a chance that a barbarian encampment will spawn, just like it did here. I'm gonna continue playing, probably until we get to the next era, and that's when I'll drop in next. 
Never mind, our Civic completed, and we are now in the classical era of civics as well, and we have our choices between classical republic, oligarchy, and autocracy. Remember, because of America's bonuses, I want governments that have diplomatic policy slots, and in this case, I think we're going to go with classical republic, because we get the diplomatic policy slot, and we're going to receive more amenities, housing, as long as our city has a district, and plus 15% great person points. Of note, you have to be making great person points, such as the great profits we were talking about, in order to get the 15% bonus. So we'll select it, hit yes. We'll receive even more era score because we're the first civilization to adopt a tier one government. And now it'll instantly bring us to our policy screen. And notice we don't have any policy slots for military, but wildcard policies can either be from wild cards or from any other cards. So if we wanted to, we could still put in discipline. We're also going to put in charismatic leader to get more influence points to gaining envoys. And we're going to get the production bonus for settlers because we're going to start churning out settlers to put down more cities. And in the case of researching another civic, I think we're going to go for drama and poetry to unlock the theater square. Based on how this game is going and the fact that America is a pretty good cultural civilization, I'm going to start concentrating on cultural growth, which the theater square district helps with a lot. Our positive relationship with Pedro has now developed into a friendly relationship. So we're going to attempt to declare a friendship with the Brazilian empire. And they're pleased to accept our offer. And because we are now a declared friend, we can't declare a war on them. And more importantly, they can't declare a war on us. Deals that we make with them are going to be more favorable. For instance, if I wanted to sell some of my diplomatic favor, I can ask, hey, what would you give me for this? And they were willing to give us a couple gold. We could also sell them some iron and they'd give us 21 gold. Now we're not going to make any of these deals. Instead, we're going to grab open borders from them and it's only going to cost us two gold. We've now officially hit the classical era, which means it's time to make a dedication. In this screen, it's going to show you that all of our citizens will exert one loyalty pressure. If we're in a golden age, they would exert more loyalty pressure. If we're in a dark age, they'd produce less. And we also get to make a dedication. Now, depending on the current makeup of your civilization, we'll guide your choice here. In this case, we're going to go with pen, brush, and voice, because I know at least we're going to start working on that theater district. And so there's an opportunity to get error score for whenever we trigger an inspiration or whenever we build a building with a great work slot. Over in Chicago, we have completed a trader. So now we can make trade routes. When we're looking at these trade routes, you can see that if we sent a trade route to Washington, we would receive plus two food, plus two production in Chicago. We could also trade with Cardiff, which would give us plus three gold. All of this is dependent on what kind of districts are in those cities. In this case, I think we're going to trade with Washington because it gives us a better bonus. As a trader moves, notice now this tile has a road. And when they complete the path all the way to Washington, moving troops and other units will be a lot quicker going through that area. We're heading towards the medieval era and feudalism. Feudalism is important because of the special unlock. Farm improvements now gain plus one food for every two adjacent farm improvements. In other words, if you put three farms together, they'll all get plus one food. It also has the serfdom card, which gives all of our builders two extra build actions, almost doubling your effective production out of them because they go from three builds all the way up to five, as long as you have the card in. Our government district in Washington is complete. So now we have the option of constructing a building inside of the government plaza. And these are one of the reasons why building a government plaza is so valuable. For instance, audience chamber gives plus two amenities and plus four housing in cities with governors. That's civilization wide, and it unlocks the Republican legacy policy card, which is a pretty powerful card. In this case, I think it can wait, and we're gonna put down a theater square. And when we're putting down our theater square, we can see what we're getting for adjacency bonuses. And while I like these plus twos, I don't want to remove the woods off of this one. So I think in this case, we're actually going to get rid of this farm. And I'll show you why. This theater square is going to currently take 11 turns to complete. But I have the ability to take this builder and remove the woods from this tile. And this will grant us 45 production. Now we will be losing the woods off of this hill. So it will only be a two food, one production tile. So doing what they call chopping, in this case, chopping the woods, to get the 45 production, whether or not it's worth it, is a pretty subjective statement, depending on the strategy that you are employing. In this case, 
we're going to do it. And now the theater square is only going to take six turns. Of note, when you research conservation in the modern era, you gain the ability to allow builders to plant woods. Now these new woods are called second growth. Woods in the territory that have never been removed are called old growth, and they all gain plus one appeal. So as Washington, I probably wouldn't remove too many woods based on our antiquities and parks. But to each their own on that one. Oh, we've finally received a flood on the Mississippi River. Notice that we had one population lost, but now the tiles are worth even more. And that was an example of the world climate. Now when we go back to the screen, you can start seeing the percentage chances of storms, river flooding, droughts, even volcanic activity and forest fires that can all impact the map. Eventually, if your carbon dioxide levels increase, for instance, if too many civilizations are building factories, the sea levels will start rising, in which it will literally remove tiles from the map. We finally have enough iron and gold, and our warriors returned to friendly territory so we can give them the upgrade to swordsmen. 110 gold, 20 iron, and we received a couple era score because our swordsmen were actually the first unit to wield weapons made of iron. And just a few short turns later, that same warrior that was promoted into a swordsman is now being promoted into a man-at-arms. This is why units are so important because they can last you the entire game without costing more production. If you start losing too many units, you have to stop producing things in and around your city, such as important buildings or districts, in order to start building more units again. Our trade route is finished between Washington and Chicago, and Chicago is much better off for it. They now have a sixth population and are well on their way to being a successful city. They're only three turns away from a nice campus that's between two mountains, and campuses get one science for being adjacent to a mountain. Now I think it's time to improve Charleston. So in order to do that, I'm actually gonna transfer this trader to Charleston. Now next turn, when I say build a trade route from Charleston to Washington, Charleston will benefit, plus we'll get that beautiful road, just like what happened here. We have finished up a settler in Charleston, and we're finally able to have the discussion on loyalty. Notice as we're in the settler lens that you can start to see loyalty numbers appearing on the map. Because Brazil is so close to this location, they're pushing a lot of loyalty, and that mostly has to do with the amount of population they have in the area. But here there's no loyalty problems, because we are pushing most of the loyalty around here. This loyalty game will become very important because if I tried to put a city here, it would last for several turns, but eventually the city would rebel and flip and want to join Brazil. The world has now entered the medieval era, which means it's time to make a dedication. This time we're in a dark age. Remember that loyalty we talked about? Well, now our citizens are only exerting half the loyalty pressure in their city. We still get to pick a dedication. This time I still think we're gonna do pen, brush, and voice. But because we're in a dark age, we gain access to what's called the dark policy cards. But they have big trade-offs. For instance, plus 75% science in cities with a holy site, but minus 25% culture. And we finally hit our first World Congress. When we start voting into it, each World Congress will come up with some different things that we want to vote upon. In this case, we have trade policy and mercenary companies. Because of our diplomatic visibility, we're given some information that some players prefer to cancel international trade routes rather than granting trade routes sent to a chosen player to provide plus four gold. The problem is I have more diplomatic favor than everybody else because of some of the choices that we've made. In mercenary companies, we can also sort of direct which units are gonna cost more or which ones can cost less. You can only vote on A or B, and in this case, I think we're gonna upvote people sending me trade routes. And we're going to do it quite a bit. Notice that each time you vote up, it costs even more diplomatic favor. And just because I want to keep the AI from producing more military troops, I'm going to upvote this and say that producing troops with production will cost more. Not that it's a big deal one way or the other, but we don't mess our mind because we have a pretty good standing army. We click next. These are our proposals and then submit. After everybody votes, we can see what the outcomes were. By hitting the plus sign, we can see how everyone voted. Notice that because we're friends with a couple of the AIs, they also voted for us. How nice of them. And then a lot of the AI chose production, but actually made them cheaper. 
so I did not win mercenary companies. You can also check the active effects, what resolutions are still in effect, and now we notice in the notifications that we've been awarded one diplomatic victory point. Back up into our world rankings, it's time to discuss how you actually win the game. Well, in a diplomatic victory, whenever you get 20 diplomatic points, you win. That requires winning certain resolutions in the World Congress, and there are some wonders and other things you can do to earn diplomatic points. To win a religious victory, your religion has to be the predominant religion in every civilization. The word predominant means at least 50% of the citizens follow that religion. Domination victory simply means that you have to take everyone's capital and hold it. A cultural victory is a little bit more complicated to explain. To help this explanation, we're going to head over to the culture world rankings button. We're not going to go too deep into this because, again, this is just a beginner guide. But eventually, you will start making tourism. Tourism comes from things like having wonders, in the case of Washington, having some nice film studios. You can use religion to develop tourism, but there are two types of tourists, domestic tourists and visiting tourists. Domestic tourists are the folks that, when they went on vacation, decided to stay in America. A visiting tourists are like the ones that went to Brazil instead. Whenever you have more visiting tourists than anyone has domestic tourists, you'll win. As you can see, we have 19 domestic tourists. If somebody were to reach 20 visiting tourists, they'd win a cultural victory. As a note, your standard culture is sort of like tourism defense. And then finally, there's the scientific victory. In order to make a scientific victory, you can't just concentrate on science. Because at the end of the tech tree, for instance, when you research satellites, you unlock the moon landing project. In order to do those projects, you have to have spaceports, which, as you can guess, take production to build. So once you have those spaceports and you launch a satellite, you land a human on the moon, you establish a Mars colony, you launch an exoplanet expedition, and you travel the 50 light years to get there, then you win the science victory. Another diplomatic opportunity has come in the form of a special session of World Congress. There's an aid request to one of the AIs. We can gain score in this aid request by sending gifts of gold, completing the Send Aid Project, and whoever wins the aid project gets two diplomatic victory points. So if you're going for a diplomatic victory, this is the sort of things you would do. I don't necessarily care about their natural disaster, so I'm going to vote it down. Thanks to our wonderful theater districts in both Washington and in Charleston, we have finally unlocked a great person. And this is a great writer. And it's because we made it to 120 great people points, and we're gaining 6.9 per turn, and when we recruit them, we now have a great writer. Now, great writers create great work of writing, and they have a couple of charges in it. The first one will pop in Washington. Here's the great work of writing. And then we look at it. It's sitting in our palace now that had one slot for writing, and our two amphitheaters both have two slots, and now we're receiving four culture and four tourism for this one great work. On the next turn, we'll send him over to the amphitheater and create a great work here. Now, when we look at our great works, we can see that we're making eight culture and eight tourism just from two great works. Now, outside the scope of this guide, you'll eventually unlock great works of music, great works of art, and have different buildings that'll be able to hold those great works. Additionally, when you hit natural history, if you're not into great and great works, you can create archaeologists. And archaeologists can run around digging up relics from antiquity sites, and you can gain culture and tourism that way. And to show you how you can compound some of these effects, if we promote Pingala, we're going to get plus 100% tourism from great works of art, music, and writing in this city. I wanted to show you what happens when you complete a wonder. In this case, we've completed the Great Library. It was a little late in the game to go for the Great Library, but it will boost all ancient and classical era technologies, and we're going to receive a random tech boost after any other player recruits a great scientist. But what's great is the Great Library will also now start producing tourism, just like our great works in Washington. I had been waiting for those great works to be able to talk to you a little bit more about great people and tourism, but I think that about covers it as far as a basic guide. Remember, this was not supposed to be exhaustive, but just to give you a primer so you know what you're looking at when you put your toes into the water. Remember to keep your Civilopedia close, take your time, read the tooltips, and most importantly, enjoy playing just one more turn. To continue learning more about Civilization, stay tuned to the channel. Consider watching my Let's Plays, 
because I don't just blindly click through the decisions I make. I normally stop and chit chat about them to try to help you understand why I'm making the decision that I did. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this guide in the comments below and what else you'd like to see in the future. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.